you know, some of my thoughts and really want to talk a little bit about what I see as some of the challenges and through the question and answers, uh, maybe engage us in a little bit of a conversation because I think um, we are in an incredible place. Um, so I guess the first point I want to make in terms of our, an overview about where we are is that despite uh, the Supreme Court's ruling yesterday, uh, I still feel hopeful. And it's strange because I think that uh, coming out of that decision, there are going to be some practical implications that we're going to have to, to deal with uh, because uh, the, the plaintiffs, the petitioners in that case did not get relief. And so we're going to, at some level, have to steal ourselves for what could be a, a tough time coming up, although I am eternally optimistic that our great warrior lawyers will find another way as they, as they have in the past. But I think we have to steal ourselves uh, for the possibility that we could be in for some, some tough times. I found, you know, as, as many people have, have indicated, there's a great deal of, of optimism coming out of those two Supreme Court dissents, Justice Sotomayor's dissent, as well as uh, Justice Breyer's dissent. Uh, I think that, I know that everybody here has already read it. I think we should read it over and over again because I think what he has tried to do is to lay out the, the roadmap for us to get to abolition, not only from a legal standpoint, but I think from a public policy, public education. So I think we need to look at that, and that's something we're going to be doing very, uh, uh, very carefully in our office. Um, and so just, you know, one other observation about where we are today, and I think it's significant, and I think it was pointed out again in the, the Breyer dissent, is that for the most part, we are seeing our narrative adopted. And this narrative that we, you know, that we've actually done a pivot on only in the last several months, if not year, about the death penalty already being dead. That's critical. You know, we've moved in the space of about a year from, from the idea that we've got to get so many states to move to abolition to a growing um, view that the consensus is building in favor of death penalty. The, the media now asks me, when do you think the death penalty is going to be abolished? Do you think it's going to happen in the next 10 years? Who would have thought, even last year, that that question would have been taken seriously? But if you look at the headlines, that is where they are. Everybody is seeing that the death penalty is in decline. And I think part of the narrative that, and, and that pivot that we've started to see is, is that we've started even to, to, to create our own map. You know, at one point we used to talk about uh, there are 19 states that don't have the death penalty. Uh, and we looked at the states that uh, had abolished the death penalty or didn't have it. Now we're able to start talking about not only states that have actually moved from a policy standpoint to end the death penalty, but we're also able to look at states that have it on the books and don't use it, or where states that have a moratorium in place. And so I think that's part of the narrative. So that's something that, that's been sort of incredibly important. You know, why have we gotten here? Uh, I think that, you know, one of the things that happened last year uh, was that we had a, a number of, of exonerations that, again, drove home to the public the risk of executing an innocent. And that is something that we know to be one of our most powerful, powerful arguments. And, you know, I just want to take a moment, once again, sort of recognize the, the struggle of Glenn Ford and the contribution that his story has made to this effort. That's why we're where we are. So, what are some of the challenges that I see and, and so where we can engage in a conversation? I think one of the challenges, and this is one of the things that came out in the majority opinion, is that we're still fighting the perception that a majority of the American public supports the death penalty. That, and that that support is, 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 is higher and stronger than it actually is. And I think we know that when we do these comparisons that uh, some of us are more or less comfortable with death penalty versus life without parole, that we can even make those numbers shift to actually show a majority in favor of something else. But I think it's important to understand the fact that those numbers shift is an indication that support is not solid. I think that's something we've got to fully embrace and something that we've got to talk about. The public is, is, is ambivalent, is concerned about these issues, and so I think we've got to exploit the idea that that support is not solid. So part of what I start to say when people come back to us with, oh, 
the, the majority of the public supports the death penalty. I said, well, they support the death penalty in the abstract, but not this death penalty. And I think the more we can keep hammering ahead of that, uh, it's going to be important. Uh, but I think that's one of the challenges that we face. We, we see that in the court. We see the court's reluctance to, to provide relief because they don't want to get ahead of the majority. So I think we've got to figure out how to change that narrative. Um, and there's also work to be done to actually have an impact on that public opinion. And I think that's where, again, this kind of work, what you're doing this weekend, what you, what, what, what you do back home is so important. We've got to figure out how to change more hearts and minds. I think we have some very good examples from other movements. You know, this, this, this has been an incredible several weeks at the Supreme Court. Um, last week we saw uh, marriage equality winning in the Supreme Court. And, and I think there's some value in, in studying how that took place. Uh, clearly it was a legal strategy, it was a litigation strategy, but there was an important cultural strategy as well, an important public education strategy as well. And as I've talked to colleagues in that field and, and looked at what they've done, again, the, the, the litigation was good, the policy work has been the same kind of policy work we've been doing state by state. But there was an intentional effort to engage and create a cultural shift that we saw reflected in conversations that people had with their families and friends and networks, in the media, in the arts. And so I think one of the things that we need to think about is how do we incorporate more of that into our work? And again, you're already doing so much of that uh, while you're here, but I think that's something that we can do. Uh, and I want to talk to you a little bit about later on how the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty is trying to take advantage of some of those lessons as well. So I think we've got to actually not only change the narrative about and the perception about the degree of support there is for the death penalty, we've also got to raise the visibility of opposition to the death penalty. I think one of the challenges, and Abe will tell you, as, as he's working in the states, is that when you go to policymakers, they want to know how many folks do you have behind you. You know, I will take this vote, but I'm not taking it alone. And I think that um, for better or for worse, we are perceived in, uh, among state policymakers as being very dedicated people, very good people, but not necessarily people who are politically connected and engaged. Uh, and so that's part of the perception that I think we have to change and we are changing. And so I think that uh, as we build more people, as we figure out how to be more connected to the political infrastructure in our states, that's gonna change. I wanna I'll touch on that a little bit uh, later on. What are some of the other challenges that I think we face? I think um, one of the, the things to watch um, that uh, came out of the majority opinion, again, in terms of you know, the death penalty and, and, and the, what is the measure of when we are, you know, there's, there really is a change in evolving standards of decency. Uh, you know, I think we have to be very thoughtful about efforts that uh, set us back. You know, we've been fortunate so far in sort of our recent times we haven't had um, the repeal work that we've done uh, undone. You know, we had the threat in Maryland, and that didn't, you know, have any legs. We now have a real possibility of a threat in Nebraska, and that's something we've got to pay close attention to. And I think part of the lesson there is at the same time that we are able to make these, these short-term wins, uh, you know, cut the deal in the legislature, get the bill passed, um, that, we, you know, as an old lobbyist, that's something I really know about. But the challenge is, how do you do that and make sure it's sustainable? And I think that's something we need to be thinking about as a challenge of going down the road. And again, sustainability means that we figure out how to build our base of support behind us, to engage more people so that there are people who understand why the, why, why the legislature took that position and are supportive or at least acquiesce. Uh, and so I think that's, that's, a, that's a lesson for us to look at. So, you know, what we've tried to do with the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty um, to respond to some of these challenges, the challenge that, that, that abolitionists are perceived as lovely people, but not politically engaged and not politically active, uh, to respond to the, the, the fact that, you know, the perception that, you know, there's not a lot of us, there's not enough of us, and that, you know, we don't have any power, and if the legislature takes a hard vote, uh, there's nobody there to back them up. Uh, one of the things we've done is to try and create uh, this campaign that you've probably heard about called the 90 Million Strong Campaign. And there's like, how did you get 90 million? Why did you do 90 million? Uh, so the, the first 
answer is, you know, the first idea was just to get in front of people that there's a lot of people who agree with us. Uh, because, there, again, there's not that perception. Uh, there's a lot of people that agree with us. And the 90 million comes from the fact that if you do the math and you look at, you extrapolate from the 37 to 38 percent that the most recent polls say are people who oppose the death penalty, that translates into about 90 million people or more, uh, not including babies, as I've been asked. Not include babies? No, no babies. Um, but uh, but so, so that, that's our first thing. And, and keep in mind how much power that represents. You know, I don't know where everybody is on gun control. I'm not making a statement about it one way or the other. But the National Rifle Association is perceived to be a very politically powerful institution. You know, when they walk in some place, the Congress and the state legislatures, they snap to attention. They only have four million members. And, I, and, I'm, and of those people, how many of those are actively engaged? So I think part of what we're trying to do is to really show uh, and, and, and create the perception that we are politically engaged and active. And so part of it's, at the beginning, blue smoke and mirrors. And part of it is actually doing the work of engaging people deeply. And I think the folks in this room are some of the folks who can do the most to help build those numbers and to build those constituencies and to carry the message. Again, the, the other part of it is doing the work. Uh, as I said, one of the things that I found to be most powerful when I looked at the, the progress that's been made around marriage equality uh, is the power of an individual. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Matt Coles, who's been at the ACLU for years leading the Gay Lesbian Rights Project, talked about their work. And one of the decisions that they made was at the same time that they did the brilliant legal strategy, at the same time they did the policy work, they, they focused on encouraging individuals to come out with their family and friends. And there was a resonance for me, because I don't, I don't know about you, but you know, there's sometimes this work is so hard that you go to a party and you don't tell people what you do, okay? Because it's, 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 it's or you don't want to have that conversation at the dinner table. Um, and, and so we miss an opportunity. Abe has taught me, Abe is one of the people that's a, that's a stalwart about like, I'm wearing this shirt, I'm having the conversation on the plane, but I want us to sleep. Um, <laughs> but I think that, that there's something there. I think we've got to, Become, we, we've got to do what you're doing already. We've got to proselytize more. We've got to figure out how to talk to people because I think one of the challenges that we observe from the 90 million people that agree with us is they, everybody thinks they're alone. And you don't. You think you're the only one. And and what we find, and I think some people touched on already, when you, when you say where you are, I can't tell you how many times people say, what do you do? And I'm like, mm, I work for the National Cultural Model Business. And, and they say, oh, let me support what you do. Things, this is not another indication of how much things are changing. So I think the more visible we are, the more willing we are to be open, to live, give that last bit of energy to sort of begin to open it up, I think we can do this. And so I think we have to uh, really focus on building more people so that there are actually real people behind us in this work. And then the other thing we've got to do is to figure out how to get people connected. Because I think that's the other piece. That people don't know, you know, they may agree with us, but they don't know how to get involved. They don't know um, the state organizations exist. And so one of the things that we want to do a better job of is actually figuring out how to not only bring more people in, but connect them to the state work. Uh, so that's a piece of it. The other piece, the other challenge that I think we, we face um, unrelated to individual grassroots is, again, this perception that, that we are not powerful. And so one of the other things that we've identified as a, as a key strategy that, again, you can be helpful in is thinking about, particularly from a state level, who are, the, who are the national leaders, who are the stakeholders in our society, who are the folks in the, in the institutions in our society that are always there when a major cultural change happens? Because this is not just a policy change. This is not just a litigation change. This is a major cultural change, and that's why it's so exciting. Uh, because I think that you know we have the opportunity to really uh, stand at the beginning, the precipice of, of like opening up and, 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 the, and bringing the light uh, to this country. That's what this struggle has been all about. And so I think one of the other things that we've been looking to do, uh, at the same time that we think it's important to do individual grassroots organization, organizing and building, is to think about and bring <coughs> national organizations that should be aligned with us on this issue. And so we've got about 15 national organizations now that span from religious organizations to uh, Alliance for Justice to Lambda Legal Defense Fund. And we are, you know, we're building this. Uh, and and what, that, what that's doing is 
it's, 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 we're helping organizations that are aligned with us that don't have the, or, the, the resources to, to speak on this and we're opening up their networks. Uh, and so I think one of the things that would be very helpful to us is to know who are the key players in your state and who are their national counterparts because that's something we want to also bring to the table. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of exciting work that we can do. Uh, we will be looking to see how we can help uh, not only bring more people in to provide more resources and tools so that people have the, uh, the, what they need to do the work. Uh, one of the other challenges and barriers to people getting engaged is that people don't feel they know so much about this issue. And, you know, they may have a conviction against the death penalty, but they don't feel as though they have the facts. And again, the, uh, opportunities like this and other things that we can do online will actually help with that. So, uh, you know, despite you know, a lot about why we should be discouraged, um, losing Glenn too soon, um, which we are hoping to, to help us build a fire behind. Uh, the Supreme Court decision, which is going to have, we pray not, but can have some, some serious implications um, for some people that have been saved by this. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. The last thing I'll leave you with, and then we can open it up for discussion, is I do think that there's some interesting things to look at um, that I think are encouraging. You know, when the Supreme Court ruled in 1972 in Furman v. Georgia uh, that the death penalty was unconstitutional and there was a de facto moratorium, you know, I had um, one of the people in our office look at this. The, the public opinion on this issue, the support for the death penalty was exactly the same place. It was at 57%. And there was a space, you know, we're sort of back full circle. Uh, in that space of 57%. It also happened at a time when there was a major overhaul for civil, you know, this, this call for civil rights. And if we look around us, and this is something we need to take advantage of, we are in that situation now. We had, you know, marriage equality, expanding rights for people. We have this incredible conversation, a tough conversation that's happening around race. We have conversations about taking down the Confederate flag. You know, that it was, was, you know, again, wherever you are on that issue, the, 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 the fact that, that people are beginning to get the connection, that even some of us, like I had lost that historical connection, I had sort of made my peace with, okay, that's what people, you know, I can't focus on that, that doesn't have that symbol. But to have people saying, really understanding the symbolism and that history and how that, that's incredible. So we're in this situation where human and civil rights are exploding. Our, our, I guess, biggest challenge and opportunity is to figure out how do we connect to those movements and how do we, we, we ride that wave and also how do we contribute our energy to those things. So I just want to leave you with a sense of optimism. Um, I'm happy to sort of engage in conversations. This is all very help, helpful to me as we think about how we do this work. I want to acknowledge my colleague Delphine, who's in the, off, in the office there with us working uh, with, as a contact with our state affiliates. Um, and it's, I don't think Anthony's here, but you've seen some of the other people in our office um, interviewing some of you and signing people up. And uh, so both of us are here, so we'd love to, to hear from you. But I'll stop now and hear your thoughts about where we are at this moment. Get your insights, uh, because again, I, I'm not in a position to sort of tell you all where we are, because you know, know better than I. So uh, with that, I'll stop and take your questions and hopefully engage in conversation about challenges, opportunities, so we can think about how to set our course together. Um, let me, before I end, I do want to thank the, the folks who've been organizing this, Scott, A, David, and, and others, um, Bill. Uh, this has been, uh, you know, I guess another hopeful point. The fact that you all were starting the fast when the case came down, who knew? Uh, all the signs are pointing in the right direction. I think we're going to get this. So with that, I'll thank you all for your work and been open enough to, for conversation and questions. It's very important to have sort of an American um, presence when it comes to international organizations that are working on this issue too. Um, I've been to conferences overseas about the death penalty and I'm an American and these are, there are plenty of people that are fighting this fight elsewhere too. So, um, you know, I don't know, there's, there's organizations based in Europe that are working on this and, and we just have to make sure that we keep those linkages too or build those linkages. Yeah, so. yeah, for, for us, it's a cost issue. I mean, yeah. we, the, the tradition of the 
history of our organization, particularly when uh, Steve Hawkins was there, he's now at Amsty, was to really build that international, um, you know, and they were part of the, one of the founders of the World Coalition, uh, and it just, there were some hard choices in terms of like just the travel. But one of the things we do uh, do is that with Delphine's help, we are connected to sort of the local embassies and, and try to keep them apprised of what's going on. Um, we often are, you know, consult, uh, and, and when delegations come through from Japan and other places, um, they're hungry to hear about our, uh, our efforts, and so we try and provide uh, assistance in that way. And I think that, you know, one of the, uh, the arguments we've been testing and is worth thinking about um, in the United States is, you know, our European allies, among others, are very interested in us abolishing the death penalty because they want the United States to become a, a real strong ally in advancing human rights, and we're, we're, we're not, we're incapacitated, we're not in a position to really do that truthfully and faithfully. And so I think part of what we think about as a long-term goal, as we're building the constituency in the death of the United States, we should also be thinking about building the constituency that's going to push our government to be a more forceful ally, because there's no guarantee that if we succeed in ending the death penalty, that that will necessarily translate into our government being as, as forceful as many of the governments of the European Union have been. And that's where we really want to be. So I think that's something to be thinking about. Sir. Yes, you spoke about the mindset of society and the high court in 72 when the Furman case uh, versus, versus Georgia overturned the death penalty. But four years later, that's Greg versus Georgia brought the death penalty back. Right. What happened? What, I mean, what was, why did the mindset uh, change so much? Well, my thesis is that that was, that was a primarily a legal strategy. And that, and that was the, that was the sort of the, the trend. That's what we did. That was how we approached these issues on a range of issues. Because yeah, we also, we found that we had to refight many of the fights. We, we won legally on civil rights. We had to refight many of those fights. And I think that's the challenge of, of doing this solely as a litigation strategy. There's got to be an accompanying uh, grassroots uh, public uh, education and cultural shift strategy. And we've got to figure out, I'm looking at Scott in particular, because I know this is something, how we, how, what we, the vision that we have is translated into the arts and, and becomes part of popular culture. And so I think that the difference is, I think where we have less danger um, be, is, be, is, is, is that the, the grassroots and the public education was done. I say we have less danger because as a function of having to pass the legislation in the states, we've had to do some amount of, of public education and grassroots mobilization to get there. So some of that work's done, but with the sort of limited, the constraints of resources that we had and the nature of like having to, you know, be very surgical in our approach to these states, um, you know, you you don't build grassroots across the state. You build grassroots where you need to get that one vote, and so that that's not a complete protection. But I think the key is, you know, we've got to. I heard somebody else say it, we've got to continue to make the case so it makes sense to the public about why the result that we get uh, is going to last. And again, the trajectory that I'm seeing us getting, of course, that the death penalty. You know, the death penalty is already pretty much as we talked about in a number of different ways. It's on the the outs. And, and so what we've got to do is give the public enough understanding that so they're okay with that. Um, being based in Washington, D.C., um, people always talk about how partisan politics is getting, or has been in recent history. Um, there seems to be a hunger for something that we can all get behind, or something that everyone can support. Do you see the death penalty issue as, as filling that hunger, filling that need, and how do we uh, exploit that? That's a good question. I mean, I think I've up to this point, um, yeah, the question is, uh, in Washington, there's a hunger for uh, people getting across, together across, you know, not being so partisan, and for people coming across the aisle to, to join forces. Um, if I was having Michael your question too badly. Um, is it, did, did I cover it all? Your, your question was really, in Washington, there's a hunger for people to come across, come together across the aisle and to, to figure out whether there's something that we can do together and is the death penalty, could that death penalty be one of those things? Right, I don't mean to imply that the death penalty could be solved through federal Right, right. But, but is that something? So, you know, I think that that is right. 
And I think that, that we've seen that uh, the, the most clear examples we've seen have been along the at, the, at the state level. You know, Nebraska is a good example. I think Kansas is, 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 a, is, a, is an example and it's a cautionary tale. Um, I think that we're, I, I, so I, and I think that I had held out the hope that, you know, in, a, in, 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 a, in places where there is this partisanship that we could find some common ground. Um, and I think we, I think we, I think it's possible. I think that, I think that we've seen some of that in the context of, of you know, left-right coalitions, high-profile Newt Gingrich, Van Jones coming together around mass incarceration. One of the challenges there, however, is that the death penalty is not on the table um, because they, they, they somehow viewed that as um, as something that was going to be too controversial, and that's one of the challenges we have to overcome. I went to a breakfast a, a while ago now uh, where Grover Norquist spoke, and he's, as you know, a noted conservative, and, and part of his sort of cachet being at this breakfast was he was part of this left-right coalition to, to end uh, you know, mass incarceration. So I, Went up to him afterwards and said, um, "Well, oh, what do you, what do you, how do you feel about the death penalty?" He said, "Oh, I'm all for the death penalty." Um, and I said, "Well, you know, I said, well, what about the fact that one of your, you know, close colleagues in this effort, uh, Richard Biggery, is, you know, against? He's with us. He's against the death penalty. Oh, he goes to church too much. Uh, so I, I think, <laughs> so I think that's one of the challenges. Um, and I think that, um, you know, clearly there's some, been some excellent work that's done, to sort of." encourage more conservatives to, to come out on this issue and to re-engage. And I think that will help. Uh, but th that is one of the challenges. So, I, so I, I think we need to keep trying. I think there's an incredible opportunity to build alliances among the, in the faith community. I've had now two conversations with um, a conservative evangelical pastors who've called me and said, I want to help. And I want to open up this conversation because I think you know one of the things I went to this the conference where there was the there was the ACLU, uh, the Koch brothers, and Van Jones, uh, Donna Brazil was like wow you know <laughs> a who's who of, of strange bedfellows, and Pat Nolan <laughs> was uh, spoke and one of the things that he said that was I, and he's he's somebody who where his organization has taken a position he's with religious conservatives um, he spoke about. The fact he says, you know, uh, people, you know, progressives think that the only thing that conservatives think about or care about is cost. But we, you know, we, particularly those of us who are, who are faith based, are really motivated by this whole idea of redemption and grace and the death penalty cutting off, or, or, or not the death penalty, and, and the criminal justice of not allowing for that to happen. And I think that's a, that's a common thread. So I do think there's, uh, there's that. I think one of the things that we've been struggling with, and I think one of the ways that we can build coalition, I was talking too much, um, is um, trying to really have a, another vision. And I think that's how you get people together. And I think, there, again, there's some opportunities. You know, out of the tragedy of South Carolina, you know, there's a vision there. Those people in that church and those, I mean, there's something there that we need to look at. And I think that that's what people are hungry for. They're, they're, they want to get rid of the bipartisan, the bipartisan rancor, but they really are hungry for another vision. And I think that's something that we can really offer. We've, we have always offered that. You know, Journey of Hope and other, you've always offered that. And now I think there's a space to really give people. People are hungry for reconciliation and healing. And I think that's what we can offer. So there's the opportunity there. I have nothing more to say. <laughs>